I apologize for this, but I'm going to ask you to do something which is profoundly un-English. I want you to turn to the person sitting next to you. It doesn't matter if you know them or not, and I want you to stare at them really, really hard. <laughs> look at the color of their eyes, look at the shape of their nose, look at the way they're smiling, or perhaps not smiling. <laughs> That's quite enough, okay. Don't want you to get too intimate. <laughs> now, of course, think about how they see you. There's a lot of differences between you and the person that you're sitting next to. Everyone is unique, and we're unique for many, many different reasons. But a very important part of that, a very important component of why we're unique, is to do with our genetic material. We've each got a unique set of instructions which tell our bodies how to produce cells, how to produce organs, how to behave. It influences everything about our lives, what we like to eat, how we stand, what we like to listen to. And of course, it also influences the diseases that we're likely to get. That's what motivates my work as a geneticist. I'm interested in using uh, or looking at patterns of genetic variation and trying to link that to how things work and why they go wrong. But it's worth being a little bit subtle about genetic variation and how that influences us. Because there are actually, at a broad level, two different axes by which genetic variants um, affect ourselves. On the one hand, we've got how genetic variants um, come into our bodies. Some of them are inherited from our parents. But then every cell in our body has its own unique genome. You know, you've got billions and millions of cells. Each one has its own unique DNA sequence. And so mutations that accumulate through your lifetime within your body play an important role. The second way, the second axis in which genetic variants uh, affect ourselves is through whether you might call them as very strong acting. So, for example, up on the top left, we've got a, an image of a, someone who has syndactyly, which is a fusion of the, the digits, which is caused by a mutation in a single gene. It's a really strong mutation, but of course, things that severe are very rare. In a so, somatic context, so that's within your body, uh, we might think of such strong mutations as causing things like cancers. But at the other end of the spectrum, we've got mutations which are much, much weaker in their effect. And that's actually the vast majority of the way in which genes influence you. For example, we might have inherited mutations that influence your chances of getting what we call complex disease, things like multiple sclerosis or MS. Here's a, a brain scan of someone with multiple sclerosis, and you can just about see the lesions in their brain. And there's strong genetic, but there's also very strong environmental effects in complex diseases. Within our bodies, the accumulation of these weak mutations also has a very strong role in how we age, for example. So as a geneticist, what I like to do is to look at our genomes. I'd like to sequence the genome of everybody in this room. I'd like to sequence the genome of everyone in the UK, even. And, and I'd like to try and map that up to what we look like and the diseases we're going to get to try and understand these processes. I'd also like to be able to do that not at the sort of the whole individual level, but also down to the level of single cells. And what's revolutionized this field in the last five to 10 years is the development of a whole new set of technologies which made genome sequencing feasible. It took about 10 years and many billions of dollars to construct the first human genome. You might remember in 2001, there was a huge splash about it. Nowadays, I can sequence your genome pretty much overnight for about 3,000 pounds. That's how far the technology has come. So if I want to be able to do this, looking at everyone's genomes, I'm now just about on the verge of being able to do that. But of course, if I want to do that, I want to interpret genetic variation, I've got to have an understanding of what's out there. What's the background of genetic variation? And that's where this project, the Thousand Genomes Project, comes in. In 2008, a group of scientists, including myself, got together and decided that we needed to have a good understanding of what human variation looked like, so we decided to sequence uh, over a thousand people taken from Europe, Africa, East Asia, and the Americas. What have we learned from that? What have we got out of it? Well, the first thing we've got is, of course, an awful lot of genome sequences. Genome is a very big place. Each one of your genomes is about three billion bases long, le DNA letters long. There are only four letters, T, C, G, and A. So if I wrote down um, each of those letters on a piece of paper a centimeter wide, 
and I started here, I'd go all the way around the world before I got back to the other end in terms of your genome. And you've got two of those in every cell in your body. So we get an awful lot of sequence. But of course, I'm interested in differences. If I put my genome and your genome side by side, actually, on the whole, they look remarkably similar. In fact, humans are one of the least diverse species out there, interestingly, at the genetic level. But about every thousand or so positions within the genome, I find some difference between them. Some of these are single letter differences, others, I might have a few, or a few more or a few less letters than you. In a few places, there are much bigger changes as well. So that's, um, that, that's the sort of the scale of the differences. We want to think about where those genetic differences come from. So every generation, you inherit about 60 or so new mutations from your mother and your father. The genome's a big place, so even though there's only one in a thousand letters that, different, that are different, across the genome, that means there are three to four million or so differences between our, our genomes. So the vast majority of these differences are not the result of things that happened in the last generation. Rather, they're the result of mutations that you've inherited from your ancestors. I want to give you a sense of that. Here's me, here's you, uh, and I'm going to follow the history of a bit of my genome back in time. So here's me. I can think of this bit of DNA going in, coming from my parents, my grandparents, great-grandparents, and so on. And I can imagine tracing this lineage back and back um, through time. I could do the same thing for you, and what I can guarantee is that at some point, there will be some person back in time, I don't know when exactly, whom, from whom we have shared the same bit of DNA. So when I take a bit of DNA from me, I can trace its history back in time through these generations, and I can do the same down the other side. Now, every now and again, and extremely rarely, but every now and again, mutations arise. There are, there's an error in the copying process of how DNA is transmitted to the next generation, which means when I look at what's in you, that sequence is somehow different. Now, what's remarkable about this is we know something about how far back in time we have to go to, on average, to find this common ancestor, and it's something like 500,000 to a million years. Now, if you think about it, that's quite remarkable because modern humans only rose about 100,000 years ago. So actually, most of the genetic variation that separates me from you arose long before the origin of modern humans. So what have we found in the project? Well, one way of looking at it is to say, what's the average genome look like? So the average genome has about 4 million places of these 3 billion or so that differ from the reference sequence, that thing that took 10 years to make. Now, the vast majority of the, majority of the genome, the vast majority of these variants, have no known function. Most of the genome is probably junk, or largely junk, um, and most of these variants probably do nothing. There's a much smaller fraction of the genome that we can interpret a little better. These are little molecular machines called proteins, and you've got about 12,000 or so changes to these little machines. Again, most of those don't seem to do much to, to how these little machines work, but there's a, a subclass, about 100 or so of these changes, which are pretty uh, bad news because they knock out the function of these proteins completely. They, they sort of cause a premature version of a uh, premature stop, if you like, in the machinery. Um, most of those, again, probably don't do a huge amount of bad things to you. But I, what I can say is that in every one of us, there's about five or so mutations which have been identified as causing a disease in particular conditions. Now, the reason why you haven't got the disease is, well, maybe you are going to get it, but it will be later. Or maybe for one of a bunch of reasons, you just got lucky. So that's something about the, the magnitude of variation. What about its geographic spread? Well, here's one way of thinking about it. There's the variation that we have in our genomes. It's about 4 million or so, as I said. Of these, almost all, 90-odd percent of the variants I have, I would find anywhere in the world. I could go to Australia, I could go to Alaska, I could go to Zimbabwe. I would find the same variation. That's kind of remarkable, and it speaks to how similar humans really are at the genetic level. In fact, there's only about one in 300 or so of the variants I have which would be unique to Europe. I wouldn't find outside Europe. 
and maybe one in a thousand, one in 10,000 thereabouts that I would only find within the UK. In fact, the number only found in you is, is as I said, on the order of um, one in several hundred thousand. So how is this helping science? How is this helping medical genetics? Well, I wanted to just finish by telling you a couple of stories or case studies about how we're using the genome sequence data from the Thousand Genomes Project in, in medical settings. In the first case, I want to go back to these very strong genetic disorders. I work with a bunch of clinical geneticists in Oxford, and one of them had, uh, was studying a family with a very unusual uh, sleep pattern in a, in a pair of brothers. Most of us work on a 24-hour cycle, more or less. We sleep a bit, we're awake for a bit. But in this family, these two brothers were working on a 48-hour cycle. So they'd sleep for 24 hours and then be awake for 24 hours. That's pretty disruptive. Um, it wasn't the only thing. There, were also, uh, uh, there was mental retardation as well. So it's was, it was quite a complex but a very unusual uh, phenotype. And they'd been looked at genetically before, but no one had come up with anything. So what we did was to sequence their genomes, the genomes of their parents, and then to try and find the mutations they had that affected these uh, machines, which no one else had. I could sort of eliminate what I'd seen in the Thousand Genomes Project. And we very quickly identified the gene involved, which is a big success. Of course, that's not the end of the story. It doesn't mean we have a cure. Wish it did. But it does mean that we have at least a place to start looking for some way of intervening in the um, disease and making it a bit better. The second example is about complex disease and going back to the case of multiple sclerosis. So, as I said, the multiple sclerosis is influenced by a lot of different genetic variants and over the last five years or so, we've identified many bits of the genome in which there's some risk associated with multiple sclerosis. But what we haven't made much progress in is identifying exactly the, me the mechanism by which that happens. But, again, working in Oxford with a, with a team of uh, experimentalists, and using the Thousand Genomes Project data, we were able to identify for one of these regions the exact mechanism by which it, the risk of MS was happening. And what was remarkable about it was that this risk was being modulated in a way that completely mimics a pharmaceutical drug. So there's a drug which if you give most people with autoimmune disease, they get better, but if you give it to people with MS, they tend to get worse. It's pretty unusual. This genetic variant was exactly mimicking that same process. Now, of course, that's a bad case. We don't want to mimic uh, drugs that make you worse. We want, to mimic, we want to identify drugs that make you better. So what we're now hoping to do is to find those genetic variants that are associated with reduced risk for multiple sclerosis and to identify existing or develop new pharmaceuticals that allow us to recapitulate that process. So the study of genome biology, or genome medicine as it's called, um, is very early. You know, there's a huge amount that we don't understand, but we're beginning to make some inroads into it through projects like the Thousand Genomes. So we're beginning to turn the idea of sequencing your genome from one in, which is basically science fiction through to one that's an everyday medical reality. Thank you. <laughs>